I'm Professor Jonathan Kithens Mazur. I'm an associate professor in the Institute for Arab and Islamic Studies here at the University of Exeter. Um, my research uh, focuses mainly on uh, North Africa, uh, and I particularly am interested in understanding political violence in North Africa. Um, people might ask, kind of, what does that mean? You know, what is political violence? Well, one of the things I'm really interested in is why people join groups like Daesh why people get involved in uh, doing uh, violent acts uh, in the name of religion or identity. Um, one of the coolest things about my job and the way that I get to do my research is that I get to go to places where no one else goes to. You might have gone on holiday to Morocco. You, you might have spent time on a beach in, in Tunisia over the course of your of your, of your summer holidays. Um, I've been to those places, they're fantastic. And actually, of course, that's an added bonus of me doing my researches. I get to go to sunny places and uh, exotic locales and, and sit with my toes in the sand occasionally. But for me, I get also to go off the beaten track in North Africa. Um, I've spent a lot of time in places in northern Morocco. I spent a lot of time in uh, various parts uh, of the interior of Tunisia. And when you go to these communities, you get to really learn about them. You get to really understand what life is like there. And when you start asking, you know, how are these people that I'm interacting with, how, what is the relationship between their lives and how a group like Daesh tries to recruit them it forces you really in some ways to try and understand the mindset of those communities. Take, for example, northern Morocco. Uh, when I was hanging out in Tangier uh, or in Tetuan or places like this, one of the things that I was finding is that as a young person, your options were incredibly limited. How you were going to live your life. How were you going to get money together to get married, to pay for education? How were you going to find something that was going to allow you to have a fulfilling adult life? And for those young people, it came down to four options about how they were going to live their lives. And remember, these are young people that are living in communities that are recently built, semi-built. Some of them don't have sewerage. Some of them don't have electricity. Uh, you know, there's just a lack of basic infrastructure. Yet these are young people who have big dreams for their lives. Dreams not least informed by looking and seeing how other people around the world uh, are living when they look at Instagram or when they watch the television. And for these young people, they really, they don't have a lot of opportunity. There's not a lot of work. There's not a lot of jobs. And what jobs there are, they don't pay particularly well. So for these young people, they really get deeply frustrated. And they get frustrated about the fact that somehow the way they think their life should be or the way that other people's lives should be is not at all commensurate with the way their life actually is. And so they come up with these kinds of four options <clears throat> about how to proceed. And the one is to try and make money any way they can. They'll open a little stall. They'll sell mobile phone covers. They'll, they'll sell cleaning products. They'll sell clothes. They'll sell counterfeit clothes. They'll sell clothes made in local workshops. Uh, they'll sell you know, whatever in some ways they can lay their hands on, but they don't have a license to do this. And so it's a very precarious existence. And it doesn't really make them a lot of money. And they're subject to all kinds of rules and regulations in terms of licensing or in terms of paying into basic social welfare that they just can't really manage. And they certainly can't manage that and to make money. The other option, particularly in places like northern Morocco or indeed in Tunisia, is to try and get out, to try and migrate, to try and get away. And we see this. Uh, increasingly becoming an issue in terms of the Mediterranean, in terms of people trying to emigrate 
from locations like Morocco, from Tunisia, from Algeria, from Libya, because they see Europe as being a kind of a, a place of luxury, a place where it's easier to survive and make that money and to build that life. Another option is to try and make it through in terms of education. But there was this amazing statistic I remember reading in Tunisia before the uh, 2011 revolution before the Arab Spring, where the government was、uh, funding people to do 8,000 more masters in foreign languages, and yet there were no jobs to go to. So education alone, without an economy, isn't necessarily a way through for these individuals. And that fourth option, which is increasingly prevalent in these、um, economically disadvantaged communities, is drug abuse. And they do things like designer drugs. There's even heroin addiction clinics emerging in some of these kinds of communities. And of these four options, none of them really kind of work or seem particularly attractive. What does that have to do with joining a group like Daesh? What does it have to do with radicalization? What does it have to do with becoming what we use, you know, what's used in the media as this popular term of terrorists? Well, one of the things that I found in my research is that these are young people, like young people everywhere. They want a better life. They want to make a difference. They want to be part of something bigger. They want to feel as though somehow their life is making a contribution. And one of the tactics deployed by Daeshi recruiters is to come in and say, "Look at your neighborhood. Look at the trash in the streets." Look at the way the government doesn't care. Look at the way that you can be as educated as you like, and yet you won't have any form of economic advancement. Isn't that wrong? And of course, the logical, rational answer to that is yes, that is wrong. I want to be part of something bigger. I want a good life. I want a fulfilling life. At which point, the Daesh recruiter would say, "Ah, I have the answer." Oh, and by the way, with this answer, I'm going to pay you a salary. I'm going to help you get a life. I'm going to help you to get married. I'm going to help you make the world a better place. Now we know it doesn't come as any shock that that was a lie, because we know the kinds of atrocities that Daesh committed in Syria or committed in Iraq, or indeed in terms of the kinds of terrorist attacks that they've launched in other parts of the world. But you can see the logic about how that might attract someone who feels as though they're blocked at every path. What do we do about this? How do we deal with this issue? One of the problems for me in the literature and in the way that we deal with it, we see this as being a problem of Islam. That somehow there's this temptation. Through religious practice, that this is what makes people bad and engage in violence, but that's the wrong way of understanding this problem. It's like looking at the telescope through the wrong end, right? It doesn't it doesn't give us the bigger picture of what we need to see. It's myopic. Instead, we really have to think about how to harness the energy of those young people. In a positive way, so they feel fulfilled, so they feel as though they're part of something bigger, so they get engaged in their local communities in projects that give them a crust to eat, a way to make a living, but also directly contribute to making their lives better, and to making the lives of their communities better. I think throughout all this research. One of the things I've realized, and it comes to be everyone's story, is is we all like to be the hero of our own stories. And one of the problems, in terms of、uh, policies and the way that we engage in thinking about how to stop people from joining organizations like Daesh, is we demonize the sets of behaviors associated with it, and rightly so. But what we don't do is think about What was it that that individual was looking for, that led them to participate 
and that kind of behavior. And certainly that's the focus for my kind of research. How can we provide those kinds of communities, those kinds of individuals with another positive option that leads to a better outcome for them and a better outcome for their societies? Thank you for listening.